All right. Well, let's uh, open your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 9. And we are going to continue our series on the topic of growth, Growth 2020. We don't want to ever forget, let's keep moving forward, right? That's what growth is about, keep moving forward. And uh, boy, is it more important now, I think, than it was in January, to be honest with you, where everything else in, uh, in the world seems to be contracting, everybody is uh, panicking, fearful, and here we are, joined together, singing praises to God. We can be excited. We can move forward. We can grow this year. Some of the greatest examples of growth are found in the New Testament when you talk about people, their individual growth patterns. And uh, when we get to the New Testament, we have to look at the gospel. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a, a step away from the Old Testament. We're going to step into the New Testament just for today, I think. You never know. And maybe be back in the Old Testament next week. But uh, we have to look at some of the disciples. Some of the disciples. Now, the disciples had both a past, that's who they were, and a future, who they were to become. And so we need to track this. We need to look at these disciples and say, this is who you were, and this is who you are to become. Some of the disciples were obviously more influential in their, in their uh, future behaviors. God uses people differently. God uses people differently. Did you hear that? God uses people differently. That's important. That's, that's super important. I don't know how many times, I mean, everybody can't be the president of the United States. Everybody can't be a D.L. Moody or a Charles Spurgeon. God uses people differently, different levels of influence. And when we get to some of these people, like Matthew, for instance, I think, it's, uh, I think it's neat to see almost a lack of information about their past. So let's look real quickly at who Matthew was. Who Matthew was, because that's kind of the starting point to who he will become. So let's look quickly at Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. One simple verse, but here it is. And as Jesus passed forth from thence... He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. That was the the tax collector booth, if you will. And he saith unto him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. I tell you, there is so much there in this verse. You know, there's not a lot mentioned about Matthew, though he wrote the gospel of Matthew. It's amazing to see the lack of information about a certain character who did such greatness. I mean, who had such greatness. I mean, when we look at the disciples, we look at those those initial 12, we would would assume that there would just be a a tremendous amount of information uh, scattered throughout all of the gospel of Matthew. We could learn about him, learn a lot about him, but we don't learn a lot about him. Here's what we know about him. We know that he was uh, also known as Levi. He was also known as Levi. Levi coming from... A Levite. He was a priest, in a sense. His parents had a priestliness to them. They were named him as Levi. The Levites were, had, had really a holy position. They didn't have any, any stake in the land, per se, so they lived off, off the tithes and offerings of the people, and, uh, which is really interesting because when you look at Levi... When you look at Matthew, who this Matthew sitting at the receipt of customs was a publican, he was a tax collector. He didn't live off tithes. He lived off taxes. And when I think about people like this tax collector, I just have this, it's just a thorn in your side, isn't it? I mean, he worked for the IRS in this sense. And so we see already some disdain. I'm sure that Uh, This isn't the the role that his parents had for him, you know? Uh, I mean, we all have this, this, uh, this dream of having our kids be president, right? I don't know how many of you have said to your kids, you could be president if you want to be. Don't lie to your kids. (laughs) 
Yeah, I tell you, we, we have these high aspirations. I have these high aspirations for my kids, for, for, for Ben and, and for Josh. I have, I, I have these desires for them, and you have desires for your kids. One of the desires you have for your kids is not necessarily to work as a shady tax collector, right? I mean, let's just, now, if my kids work for the IRS, I'm still going to love my kids, okay? But this is a little different back then. These, these tax collectors, these, these publicans, they collected taxes for Rome. But the way they got paid was to go above and beyond that. So whatever they got above and beyond what they owed Rome, they kept for themselves. So you know what that builds? That builds itself kind of a system of shadiness, of impropriety, you know? If I got to give Rome 500, if I can make 600, I get 100 for myself. So there's all sorts of extortion and things like that, and, and, and I can just imagine. Now, it doesn't say this in the text, okay? Uh, but I can imagine that, uh, that Matthew kind of had a shady past, a past that maybe his parents wouldn't be proud of and, and, and a past that, that he wouldn't be proud of. And how many of us can say today that, you know what, I have a past that I'm I'm not really proud of. You know, some people, they say, well, I'm not, a, I'm not ashamed of my past. I've, I've, I've moved beyond that. Okay, well, you, you can say that if you want. That, then you're in, the, you're in the minority. Most people are not totally thrilled with who they were. Most people are not totally thrilled with that. And if you have never done anything you're ashamed of, you're in the minority. Because I can say that I think right now everybody in this room can say, you know what, Pastor Joe, I'm not totally thrilled with my past. And if I could go back and change it, I would. Some people say, well, I would never change my past because it made me who I am. Okay, you're again in the minority. The reality is, is that we all have a past of some sort. We all have a, in the past struggled with things in our lives that if we're honest with ourselves, we would be ashamed of. We'd be ashamed to admit. Now, Matthew had a terrible past. I, I really believe that. But Peter also had a terrible past, didn't he? When you begin to look at some of the disciples, what they were doing, what they did, who they were, I, I think of Peter and his failure to, to proclaim the Lord when he was called out for it. I think of that in Luke chapter 22, Beginning in verse 54, it said, and, and, and Peter followed afar off. Now, can I tell you today, Christians, that there are, there are plenty of people out there, Christians, who are following the Lord from a distance. That really, when they get in, in trouble, they're not really concerned with drawing nigh to God. But the Bible says, draw nigh to him, and he will draw nigh to you. But you know what? There's Christians who, who, who want to stay out of it. Who kind of look at their Messiah from a distance. And that's a shame. They don't want to get close to the Lord. They don't want to be intimate with the Lord. They would rather just stay out of it. And can I tell you something? That if Christians stay out of it too long... The problems just get worse. Not going to get better. There are plenty of Christians out there who say, well, you know what? I don't want to really be associated. I don't want people to think I'm one of those Bible thumpers. I'd rather just follow my Lord from a distance. I think there's a lot of Christians that do that. Peter was one of them. Following the Lord from afar. When you get to verse 57 in Luke 22, you know what it says? And he denied him. I can't imagine that Peter was excited about this. Here he is following his Lord from afar, denying the one that saved him. Where do you think it started? It wasn't because he was up close and personal with his Savior. He was trying to stay at a distance. Verse 61, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. It's just prophecy fulfilled. You stay at a distance far enough, you don't say enough about the Lord, 
you'll begin to deny him just as the Lord prophesied. And you know what happened? Here's what happened. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. How many of us have wept bitterly because we haven't taken a stand for the Lord we ought to take? You think Peter was excited about this? You think he's excited about his past? You think he's in heaven right now saying, boy, I am just really excited about who I was. Following the Lord from afar, he, he could have been, he could have been following the Lord closer. He chose not to. But Paul had a, had a terrible past. Paul had a terrible past. God still used Paul. He used Peter, Paul, in Acts 22, 4. And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering, delivering into prison both men and women. This way that he was persecuting unto death was, were those people who were following the Lord. Remember, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Who's this way, this group of Christians who are pursuing God? You know what? He was, he was literally capturing those professing Christians, literally binding. He was literally imprisoning them, killing them. That's a pretty terrible and shady past. Now, God still used him. 1 Timothy 1 and 15, it says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Paul said, I, I'm the worst of them. I am the worst of them. I persecuted Christians to the death. Peter denying the Lord that bought him, following him from afar. You think he was really happy with his past? I don't think so. But aren't you so glad that, that Christ made us a new creature? Aren't you glad that the Lord can look beyond who you were to the person that he is trying to conform you to become. I am so thankful that we are created new. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, if any man be in Christ, saved, if they're in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Aren't you thankful that you're not living the life you used to live? Now, we can all be better. But I am so thankful God saved me out of my past. I'm so thankful for that, that we are a, a new creature, that we, there's something new. Don't you love something new? I mean, I'll be honest with you. I love new things. I love that new car smell. You know? Now, in years to come, we're going to find out that it has some asbestos or something. Did you know baby powder now has an asbestos base to it that it's like, you know how many times I put baby powder on my feet because my feet were wet? I'm probably absorbed all that. And it's not even this. It was like from the rock that asbestos is found in. I don't know. I like new, I, I, you know, a new baby. Isn't it just wonderful? Especially when they're sleeping. <laughs> yeah. And they're not crying, not wanting things. The new car smell, the, 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 a, a new baby, a new book. I love new books. I wish I finished all the new books I read. I like old books. I like old books. I love smelling old books. They have kind of a, a musty smell. I think they should make a cologne <laughs> called the Musty Book. Sometimes I find myself smelling my old books. I do that with my Bible. Do you guys do that? I'm just weird like that. I just love that. You go into a bookstore, and you just you flip the pages, and it's kind of, you kind of, and you go. But it's still a new book to me, so I like it because it's new. I like things that are new, and I, and I, and I like the fact that we are a new creature. That when you get something new, 
it, it kind of displaces the old, doesn't it? You get a new car, and technically you're not driving the old one because you got a new one, right? I got a new car. You get a, you get, you get a, you get a new uh, ukulele or something. I don't know. You get something new, and it's just exciting. And you know what? I'm, I love the fact we're a new creature. And we shouldn't dwell on the things of the past. Should we think about them? Yes. We should, we should think about it. Let's, let's never forget them. Here's what Paul said in Philippians 3. Not as though I have already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I might apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ. Brethren, I count myself not to have apprehended. He says, this, I haven't gotten everything. He says, but there's one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward into those things which are ahead. Now listen. He obviously didn't forget in totality all of his past. He would have never, he, he wouldn't have given his testimony. Three times in the book of Acts, he gave his, a lengthy testimony about his past. What he did is he didn't allow that testimony, that past, to, to uh, push him down to the point where he couldn't rise up to the occasion. So he, he allowed the past even to help catapult him into the future, but he was a new creature. He was a new creation in Christ Jesus. This is, who, this is who Matthew was. He was a tax collector. He was a publican. He, he ran with kind of that rowdy crowd. But well, let's look at who Matthew became. Who did Matthew become? We saw who he was. Now let's look at who he became. And can I remind you that our future is always more important than our past? Our future is always more important than our past. It should be what takes priority. The choices that you make today are more important than the choices you made yesterday. Yes, those choices have an influence, have an impact on you today. But the choices you make today will impact your tomorrow. That future is much more important. And we'll look at two areas just real quickly in Matthew's life. First of all, first of all he responded rapidly. He responded rapidly. This, is, this to me is just amazing. There's... Three parallel passages that have this account. One in, one in Matthew, one in Mark, and one in Luke. In Luke, Luke's gospel, chapter 5, verse 28, it says this. And he left all, listen to this, and he left all, rose up, and followed him. Now here Jesus is walking along the way, and he sees this publican. He, he, he wasn't... He, he, remember, he was at the receipt of customs. He, he was not in the synagogue praying. And to me, that's, that boggles my mind that he could have chosen anybody along the way, and that's who he chose? Are you kidding me? I mean, come on, Lord, you could have, you could have picked somebody better than this guy. This guy had a, had a lousy reputation, a shady past. There's no way that God can use this guy. But he did. So he calls out to Matthew, follow me. And you know what Matthew did immediately? He began to reason with himself all of the, 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 the challenges of ministry. He began to ask himself questions like, uh, 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 I wonder what it pays to be in the ministry. He asked questions to the Lord, like, Lord, uh, will my life be at stake at all in any of this? Lord, will you actually provide? I don't know you. He went home and asked his parents, and he asked his children and said, oh, guys, what do you think about this? Here's the Messiah calling me to follow him. Should I or shouldn't I? And he begins to run through, begins to run through all of these questions about why he shouldn't do exactly what God has told him to do. So he's, he's flustered in this thing. He's, he's raking in the dough as a tax collector. That's a joke. Dough, tax collector, money. Anyway, he's raking in the money, and there he is. He, he says, you know, Lord, I just don't feel like it's in the best interest of my family to really follow you like you've asked. I believe that uh, maybe, you're, maybe you're God. But I'm just not exactly sold on this whole thing. Follow me. There's just too much at stake here. It's actually not what he did. It's, it's very, very simple. Listen to this. In just, a, in just a few words, here's what happened. I love this. Verse 28. 
and he left all, he rose up and followed. Now listen, this is, this is great. Now, I, I don't know the, 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 the Greek order of this. I did not look into the Greek. I'm just reading the English. But in both Matthew and Luke's gospel, this is the priority. He left all, he rose up, and he followed. You know, it doesn't say that he rose up, followed, and began to leave all as he realized that this way is the right way. I mean, before he even got out of the chair, in my mind, or wherever he was sitting at the receipt of custom, before he even got up, he left all. He, he had made this up in his mind. I'm going to leave everything behind. And he got up and said, I'm following you, Lord. He responded rapidly. There was no reason to doubt this commandment. Follow me. I find that Christians oftentimes come up with a million reasons why not to do what it is God wants them to do. We, 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 we do. I do. Come on. Let's face it, right? We, we, we have this calculated faith. <laughs> we, well, Lord, just, just, let me just, as long as it makes sense to me. As long as there's no harm. As long as... As long as my family is, is, is taken care of, you know what? No man who putteth his hand to the plow and looketh back is worthy of the kingdom. It's not a, listen, God will take care of your family. I said last week, what did he say? He said, let the dead bury the dead. God will take care of that. How many of us don't rapidly respond to the Lord when he asks us to do something? How many of us kind of have that still small voice that just kind of is a nagging still small voice? And, 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 and we, just, we just do not respond as quickly as we ought to. How many of us, how many of us have a, have a seared conscience? How many of us are like in 1 Timothy chapter 4, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron? How many of us are like that? That, that our conscience, that our, that, our, that our innermost being is just like, you know, I just, I just don't feel the effects of sin anymore in my life. I've been working real hard with the boys, and it's fun. I have these calluses on my hands, and and they're not like they they're not like they used to be, you know. I used to have these calluses on my hands that were literally on every single uh, knuckle, ev everywhere. And, and I ran a shovel; I could outdig anybody. I didn't wear those gloves. Those gloves were those gloves were for girls, you know, and. Uh, I don't need gloves. You know what I'm talking about, Max. You don't need gloves. Right, Howard? We don't need gloves. We just go out there. We just get it done. Joe, you don't need gloves. You shake Joe's hand, and it's like sandpaper, you know? There are some people who just have these really strong hands all callous. And you know what? I don't feel pain in my hands like other people feel pain in their hands. Now, I'm not going to do something stupid like grab a thorn bush intentionally. And sometimes I'm like, wow, that did kind of get me right between there. I don't have any callus between there, you know? And that's where the thorn gets you every time in there, somewhere. And, and you know what? Some people, some people are so callous. They are so callous to sin that they can't even, they don't even, they don't, can't even, they don't even identify it. It's, there's pervasive wickedness in the world, and they, they, they just, they just kind of consume it. They just kind of consume it. And they become so desensitized. Is that, is that you? I hope not. I hope that's nobody in this room. Where, where, where we become desensitized. That we can respond rapidly when God says, don't do that. When God says, do that. We can, we can leave everything aside, rise up and follow him and say, yes, Lord, I am in. What is it that you want from me, Lord? 
What is it you've called me to do today? Some of us just get so scarred and we become disobedient at every, at every calling of God. So number one, he responded rapidly. And secondly, he witnessed willingly. He witnessed willingly. In Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 15, it says this, And it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house, in his house, referring to Matthew's house, that many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many. And they followed him. There were many people that sat with Jesus in Matthew's house. And you know what, you know what the Mark says? They were publicans and sinners. You know what's interesting? Here's what I think happened. Here's what I think happened. I think that Matthew was so excited about who he was following, he couldn't help but to share it with other people. He was so excited about what he had just found. And you know, I tell you, I wish more Christians were like him. Mean, he willingly witnessed. See, I think he brought his, his friends into his house to introduce them to Jesus. That's what I think happened. I think it was th- they were that excited, that he was that excited that he, he got them all, invited them all to dinner, publicans, because those were, his, those were his friends, because, you know, the birds of the same feather flock together. One publican knows another publican. And, and, so, and, and so he gets his publican friends together, gets the sinners together, and he brings them into his house and introduces them to the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but I like something new. And I like to share things that are new. I love it. when I, My dad, he sent me, my mom and my dad, I, sh- I should show this. My mom sent me this picture. She says, I got a new toy today. And she's standing on the stoop of her house, and she racks her new shotgun. <laughs> and so that was kind of fun. And I'm sure when I go up there, I'll see it. And then uh, about two minutes later, I get this other text. Dad got something new too. And he, and I'm just like, now that's cooler than a shotgun, you know. And, you know, here's the thing. When it comes to something new, you just love sharing it, don't you? I mean, I just, it's hard not to share something new. You almost feel, you almost feel like proud, you know? Like you drive up in this new car, and you're just thinking to yourself, I hope they ask me, <laughs> because I don't want to be the one to tell them. <laughs> and you're just excited, you know? I mean, I don't know, like your faith, man. You get the little baby, and, uh, and you just walk this little baby around, and you say, hey, well, this guy looks like me. He's so handsome. Isn't he goo goo gaga? And then he starts to cry, and you hand him off to the mom. And she takes care of him until he stops crying. Then you get him back. And, uh, and you're just so excited. You have this new baby, and you have a new car. You have a new, a new spouse. This is my, my new wife, in case the old one didn't work out. So this is my new spouse. You know, we just got married. And you can't wait to show people the wedding pictures. You know, these are the wedding pictures. That's how guys look through pictures, by the way. Yeah, that's the cake. Yep, yeah, I have pictures. Now, a woman, she's got that thing, and she whips it open, and she's looking through all these pictures, and they just look, and, and they look at more, and they look at more. You know what I'm talking about. Guys, they just are totally disengaged at this point, you know. But got your new spouse, and your new baby, and new car. And I think Matthew, he says, this is, this is what I'm into right now. This is the guy. I'm into this guy. This is the Savior. I think he was willing to witness to his friends. I think he's willing to witness to, to the, the, the rest of the pop, populace. Just any sinner. Just grab him. Come in. Bring him in. You know, go out into the highways and byways and bring him in. Let's tell people about Jesus. It wasn't, it wasn't like, you know... Remember, the Great Commission came later, okay? At this point, there was no Great Commission. The Great Commission came at the end of Matthew, not in Matthew 9. I'm telling you, this happened first. He was willing to witness to people and share with other people his newfound faith. And so are we that willing? Are we that excited? I mean, do we say to ourselves, this is the day that the Lord hath made, man? I mean, do people walk around you and say, man, that guy's peculiar. 
I mean, you know what? The, the economy is falling apart. People with masks all over their face and on their head. I mean, just like people with a mask and a shield standing behind a plexiglass. And it's like, dude, I would have to literally maul you. You know, but I can't because I'm six feet away. I mean, there's not a cough or a sneeze in the world that get contaminated these people. It's like, they're just, there's, it's just so scary out there for people. I mean, this world is living in panic. Do people look at us Christians and say, man, that guy has the joy of the Lord? Man, though anything comes his way, he'll hit a curveball and a, and, a, and a fastball and a knuckleball and a spitball, or I'm sure there's other kind of things out there, right? I mean, you play baseball. There's like a thousand different things you could throw. I mean, we can deal with anything, right? Because we're Christians. Because we're following the one who said he'll take care of us. And praise God for that. Are you willing to witness? Are you going to respond rapidly? When God says, jump, you start jumping. And say, yes, Lord, I'm in it. You tell me how long you want me to go with this, and I'm willing to just keep going until, until I can't go any longer, and I know that you'll sustain me if you want me to keep jumping. Matthew was a, was a total disaster. It became one of the people who penned the gospel. I mean, the gospels, I mean, there's just like four guys, you know what I mean? I mean, he, this, is, this is an amazing character, and God used him in a mighty way. Brought him out of some place like tax collecting. And remember, I'm not talking IRS tax collecting. I'm talking, you know, massive levels of impropriety. Known as kind of the scum of the earth. And here he is, winning people to the Lord, excited, inviting people over to his house for dinner. Come meet my Savior. Come meet my Lord. And he'll show you how good he is. In conclusion, let me say this. Don't focus on where you've been. Focus on where you're going to be. Don't focus on the past. I remember when Dana and I started to date. And uh, there's, there's just all manner of conversations you can have with your, your boyfriend, girlfriend before you, or, uh, before you get married. So, you, so here we are, we're dating. And, and I came directly out of the world, right? I mean, literally, um, it, was, it was horrible. You know what was interesting? She never asked me one time about my past that pertain to wickedness. She never asked me about my girlfriends or what we did. She never asked me about drugs or alcohol. She never asked me about anything because she knew that's not the guy I was. She says, that's who, she says, that's who you were, but this is not the guy who you are, and it's certainly not the guy you want to become. And so as long as my eyes were fixed on the Lord, I mean, Dana has just been at peace. And you know what? We should do the same thing. Hey, listen, we're going places. I'm not concerned where I've been. I'll never forget it completely. I'll never forget it completely. But I've got my eyes set on the prize. I'm running a race. And if you're going to run a race, you run as not one that beateth the air, but you run to win. You look forward and you run and you run and you run and you run. And if you've ever seen any tapes of of, of epic fails in, in uh, uh, sports, Olympics. It's amazing how many people, how many people have failed because they looked over their shoulder. Swimming, you see it in swimming. Somebody who just looks a little too long behind them, somebody running a race, and they look to see where the other guys are at, and they lose. So you don't look over your shoulder. You look, you look straight ahead. Because God can take you from where you were to where you want to be. And that's a wonderful, wonderful miracle. And Matthew's a great example of growth. This is how one way we can grow. This is just one way we can grow. Don't, don't look behind you. Look in front of you. Growth is ahead. It's not behind you. Don't live in the past. Live for the future. 
And friends, if you haven't willingly witnessed to somebody lately, I'm asking you to just do that. And I haven't been as faithful as I ought to be either. And, and it is hard. Standing behind a shield and behind a mask in a plexiglass in a bubble in another room, it's hard. But people are still willing to take a tract. People will still take a tract. And if you haven't willingly witnessed to somebody, respond rapidly and do it. Jesus Christ died for you. and He died for everyone in this world. He is, he is the Savior of the entire world. Not just, not just your one friend or not just you. Share that, share that with people. Share that with people. Salvation in this time is more important than ever, I think. I'm so grateful he died on the cross for us to pay for our sins. Simple faith alone in Christ alone. And we can say, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in his name.